Hello. Hello, everyone. And oh, sorry, did you want to introduce us? Okay. Oh. okay. I'm assuming you're calling your name. You had a 50 50 chance. Yes. <laughs> and you got it wrong. Yes. <laughs> Hello everyone and welcome to the session. This is Podcasting Your Passion with Kylie Sturgis and Daniel Midgley. Yo, as you can tell, I'm an American. Now, if you want to be looking at the slides as you go, you can go to this URL, tinyurl.com slash swancon2015podcasting, and uh, that will get you the PDF. I've got to find a better way of doing this. Let's, uh, let's start with you, Kylie. Tell us about your show. Hi, I have a podcast called Token Skeptic. It is the longest running podcast that I have done. I've got uh, a few others that I've contributed to or I'm currently working on. However, Token Skeptic is pretty much the mainstay. And you can find it at tokenskeptic.org. It looks at skepticism. It looks at pop culture, science in Australia, and the intersection of all these things. And essentially, it gives me a great opportunity to interview interesting people and get their message out there. You want to hit this? Hit me. There we go. Just the space bar. There we go. My podcast is called Talk the Talk. It's a weekly podcast about language on RTR FM 92.1 every Tuesday morning at 11. You can hear me there. Uh, we talk about recent goings on in language, uh, advancements in the field, technology, minority languages, uh, grammar, and linguistic prescriptivism. And we also get into a good bit of word nerdery. Every once in a while, we do get wordy with nerds. It's it's fabulous geekery. It's good fun. All right, you want to talk us through how you got into this biz? Okay, I did not get a start in radio. I essentially got my start due to the encouragement of another podcast called Skepticality, and they are one of the big podcasts over in the USA. And I think that's not unusual for many people to hear of another podcast, see another podcast happening, and say, "Oh, that doesn't look too challenging," or maybe I should give it a try. And it was through that that I started interviewing people, either vodcasts or podcasts, small segments, and eventually branched out into my own show. Uh, the photo that I've got there is not quite accurate. The large microphone that I'm holding is a prop from a friend of mine. However, essentially what I do is use a laptop and speak into it using headphones. I interview people via Skype, I interview people in person using audio devices, uh, MP3 recorders, and essentially uh, blossomed from there. It's now up to nearly 200 episodes of a podcast. I travel internationally, I podcast internationally, and essentially try to get uh, messages and news and issues and events that are happening around the world onto my show. And I got started because Alan Dench, a fellow linguist at UWA, uh, was doing a weekly call-in thing on Tuesday mornings. It was just a tiny thing, and he was he was ill one week. He said, could you do it? So I thought, well, since I live really close to the studio, I'll just take the bus on in, and I just came in. And Alan eventually handed that over to me, and I've kind of been building it uh, every Tuesday, just going over to the station. And we're now up to about 200 shows yeah. ourselves. Yeah. So you were originally a talkback show? But no, RTR doesn't do a lot of talk back because on most radio stations they have a seven second delay so that if somebody starts saying something no, bad, sure. then you can yeah. put the kibosh on them with no problem. Mm. Uh, but no, it's all live to air. Oh. So um, the funny thing is RTR doesn't have a very big call-in culture for that very reason, and so mm. it's been kind of difficult to get a reaction. But we've been getting people to email and to phone in to me, and then I read out comments over the air, and yeah. it's becoming quite successful. Yeah. Uh, I certainly don't have call-ins, most of the interviews are just set pre-recorded pieces and that's it. But people occasionally comment on Facebook, Twitter and the like and social media. So okay. What, okay, so how do we through, go through this? What is your podcast about? Find out what's out there. For example, I discovered that I was one of many in a growing field of sceptical and science podcasts. And so for myself, I said, okay, well, what do I see as being a particular niche? I don't see many interviews run by solo women, for example, which are exclusively broadcast online. I don't see many which have an international uh, reach and certainly not many with an Australian voice. So that was my goal in terms of saying, okay, this is something I see as a, a small area of need and I'll just work hard on it and make it my own. What led you to say, right, what's out there? Well, um there aren't a lot of linguistics, well, five years ago when I got started, there weren't a lot of linguistics podcasts. Now there's Lexicon Valley with yeah. Slate, and that's a pretty big one. Um, there was the Speculative Grammarian. That was, those two were the main ones, and then there was, there was us. 
Yeah. And uh, lately there have been more language podcasts out there and starting to grow and start, the, the feeling that I get is that linguistics and language is, uh, there's a great deal of interest, a great deal mm. of groundswell coming up about it. Yeah. So it's been fun to be a part of that. Yeah. Um, one of the things it's important to do if you're going to know, let me just, anybody doing a podcast currently or thinking about doing a podcast? No. Okay. Uh, one thing you want to do is find what makes you different, what makes you special. So if it's the Australian thing, that is good. Uh, for linguistics at least, there are a lot of Australian languages that are dying out or that are being revitalized, and so it's uh, a really burgeoning area, something that's really interesting. Uh, honing your expertise is certainly something I've grown to do more and more with working on a podcast in order to say, okay, how can I up my tech, how can I up my technique, who else is doing this out there that is popular, what do they do, and adopting uh, yeah, their work. Um, during the time that I was podcasting, I also ended up writing a master's thesis in the field of scepticism and paranormal and pseudoscientific belief. So in many ways, it was a great opportunity to interview the people who were writing the books that I was studying, and that was, that was an opportunity too. You, know, um, you, don't, you don't want to get it wrong. There's a, there's a fear of getting yeah. it wrong, which can be paralyzing. Yeah, don't, don't be afraid to have a we, we made a mistake episode as the next episode. I've seen podcasts do that. Yeah, it's cool. You know, mm. put it to slide on Okay, here's the list of things that you're going to need if you're going to do a podcast. First of all, something to say. And, and you mentioned that already. What the hell do I say? Yeah. Do I have anything to say? Yeah. I think sometimes people feel like they don't have anything that nobody would want to hear what they have to say. And it's really kind of not true. If you've got something that you know something about or you're willing to learn more, then you have a, a good reason to use your voice. Mm. Uh, in the case of Daniel's show, he always has something to say because you always have a co-host as well, and that can be quite valuable. People bouncing ideas off each other and finding connections that way. Now, your, your podcast, you do have interviews. I have interviews, so I um, interrogate and investigate particular concepts with people I talk to, yeah. yeah. But you also do, but you're also kind of solo. I, I consider myself a solo podcaster and I've done one or two episodes where it's just me reading an essay, for example, and there's plenty of podcasters out there who do that in literature. They are, for example, Scott Sidler, JC Hutchins was an example, Mer Lafferty. They essentially record their own books before they get them out there in print, and Scott Sidler is a classic example, someone who's done that very successfully. Mm. But for me, it's always me and Ben Ainsley talking about stuff. So having somebody else to talk to can be very nice to bounce yeah. stuff off of. Absolutely. And a lot of podcasts do that. It's like yeah. three, three people. Yeah, uh, the stereotype is uh, three dicks and a microphone, three blokes sitting around a microphone for about an hour going on about, oh, yeah, there's a bloke here, da da da, football, da da da. That's a stereotype, and unfortunately, it is kind of an act. Kind of true. One. Okay, stuff that you will need, a microphone, uh, if you're reading a radio here. station. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> I, I like the Yeti blue, it works for me when yeah. I'm doing home stuff. Uh, you know, you could do this all kinds of different ways. The uh, audio recorders are very cool, mm -hmm. uh, good for interviews. Whatever you do, you're going to need a computer. I do everything on my MacBook Air and that does for me. Uh, recording software and editing software for me, that's the same kind of thing. We'll talk about that, I think, in a sec. What else do you use? Uh, I use a number of handheld devices. I also use my Mac laptop, which has an inbuilt recording device, and I use Skype. Um, here's a number of exa Here's some that we brought in earlier. Uh, this is the Zoom H4, which I first started with. Zoom is quite a useful company. I have a Zoom H1 over there, which is recording this show. It's a smaller version of this. Um, Tascam is quite a popular um, company that produces audio devices and I've seen that recommended by people who are in the radio industry who are going out to do field work. This is a um, iRiver which I got from JD Hi-Fi for about $60. Simple, small, I used that when I was being a research student, put it in front of the table and it recorded people quite nicely. Essentially, go down to JB Hi-Fi, have a look at what they've got in terms of MP3 recorders, and that's quite useful in terms of recording people that way. There's plenty of software out there. Um, I currently use Pamela, for example, I think is the name of the program. I can find it for you and pop it online if you need be. But yeah, essentially anything that records Skype is quite useful too. And we have a question. Are we taking questions? Yes, we are. Yeah. Um, thank you very much. Um, I have got nearly everything except I've been looking for a good microphone, a quality one. Yeah. So the question is, where can you get a good quality microphone? I got my Yeti Blue at just the Apple Store, which is out there. Um, you know, again, JB Hi-Fi can be very good. 
Uh, don't forget to look online. You can find yes. things online. Be sure to read your reviews. Most of the microphones that I've seen out there will do a pretty good job. Yeah, I had two things. One, when I finally got someone who was an incredibly generous donor, the first thing I did was go online and find myself a podcasting pack where they said, right, we'll give you the stand, a pop filter, which is the useful thing that goes here on the microphone, so you go like that the whole Hello. time. It's awful. Yeah, don't do that. Um, a pop filter, it gave me a mixer as well. And essentially that did the whole thing for me. Another useful thing is actual audio uh, places, places which sell musical instruments. So there was a store that was closing down and they were getting rid of their mics. So I ran down there and said, hey, what have you got here? And they said, oh, this is two microphones, one's for your guitar, one's for you. And I said, yeah, I don't care. I just need microphones. And they said, well, these are good quality ones. We'll give them to you at cost. And I said, great, snap that up. So hop down to audio um, warehouses, hop down to JB Hi-Fi, tell them what you're after and certainly look online and find reviews. As Daniel said, a Yeti does perfectly well. More often than not, I sometimes use the microphone that is in my laptop and that can sometimes do quite a good job too. You don't? Work quality for what I want to then yeah, start researching into uh, stores and start talking to them about how I want to require, I require good high quality voice and certainly contact a radio station and ask what they're using. Look at the brands, for example, uh, on the microphone that you're holding, it's a Behringer, that's quite a well-known brand. This one here. A sure microphone, and uh, both of these are quite well regarded examples. So, look for um, as I've always been told in regards to looking for technology, if it's a well known brand, you're pretty much safe. And sometimes they have a warranty too, so if they screw you up, you can get your money back. You don't need to spend a thousand bucks, really. You can get no. by with a few hundred, yeah. And that'll get you started. What's next? Uh, okay, a companion website is a must. If anyone's going to know that you're out there, then you need to have a web presence. Uh, and this is a great place to drop your show notes. This is what I do. Yeah. Um, there are all kinds of blogging platforms. As you can see, I'm using Blogger, which does just fine. Mm -hmm. yeah, there's a pod, uh, there's a uh, post for every episode, and it's got information and notes and things that I used. Yeah. I, it, very important when you use information to show where you got it. Mm. Uh, cite your photographs. Uh, take your own photographs. There's always one way of doing things I do. I ended up doing a graphics course so I can create my own logos and things like that and designs. That helps too. Uh, I use WordPress. I yeah, use a self host, uh, my own website, and it hosts WordPress, and that does the job quite well. There's a couple of plugins that enable you to uh, host your audio on there too, so people can either download it or play it straight from the site or hop onto iTunes. A willingness to promote yourself. Yes. You, there's, a, uh, there's a line out of Hey Look Me Over, which is a song from the musical Wildcat, and it, it's always stayed with me. And it's How Can You Win the World If Nobody Knows You're There? Yeah. You can't win the world if nobody knows you're there. You have to sort of be out there. Mm. You don't have to, not wearing your own t-shirt all the time, mm. but willingness to talk about it and promote. And people are going to hate you for that. People will hate you because you are promoting something and that's just something you've got to get used to. It doesn't matter if it's in music, it doesn't matter if it's in art, it doesn't matter if it's your current research. People are going to show up and no one's interested in you, attention whore. It sometimes uh, seems to be directed at women more particularly, which is a little bit scary. Which I is, was going to say, I, I've never gotten any of this. I wonder why. Um, yeah. <laughs> Big American male. Oh, no. No, but no, I'm certain that John yeah. Scalsey um, probably, I mean, he was talking just recently about how he was on the hashtag for the Hugo Awards and he was just like mute, 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 mute. And he's an American white guy. and. He voiced an opinion which wasn't popular with a certain subsection. That's the important thing to realise, that it's often just a subsection. They might be just jumping on a bandwagon. They don't know you. They don't give a damn about you. They don't care about the work you put in. They don't see the work that you put in. They just think it's really cool to jump on and start making fun of you online, in person, to harass you. And even in some cases, I've had the experience of being stalked. And thankfully, there are ways that you can report this, block them, shut it down and most importantly do not let it stop you this is something you're passionate about and this is something that you know is worthy and that you are getting support from people who you know are rational as opposed to irrational and just screaming heebie-jeebies at you the whole time then why why let it stop you we don't see scousy walking out of this conference going oh my god that's it no one likes my point of view about the hugo awards i give up writing altogether now he's upstairs still smashing away at the next novel so you know hey take inspiration from that and this is the uh, one important thing, to, you know, they say don't engage with trolls, and I think that's true, mm -hmm. but with the sincere critics, engage. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, report them, uh, use Twitter harassment, they start taking it seriously, report it on Facebook. I even took my uh, stalker details to ACORN, which is the federal website, said this is a guy 
he was employee of here, here's his name, here's his address, here's the very long documented history of what he's doing. Oh, and here's the people who seem to think that this should be dis dismissed. You should keep an eye on them as well. And they immediately reported back and said, yeah, that's a problem. Hmm. So, but hey, does it stop me? No, I'm bloody well standing here in public. You know, I don't care. I am podcasting. So you are. And this is why you need a, uh... go ahead. Oh, yes, and that. <laughs> a bit of mental toughness and just not giving a fuck. Yeah. In the end, you have to say to yourself, okay, have I got something worth to say or am I talking to people with something worth to say? Will I keep doing that? And you have to say, yeah, it's okay. And if I stop, it's because I choose to stop. Expect a little bit of criticism. Yeah. Okay. Uh, oh, one of the great things about doing a podcast Yay! is that it's given me a chance to interview people who are prominent in the field. I've gotten a chance to interview, uh, what, John McWhorter and Charity Hudley, um, uh, Ammon Shea, uh, Talia Wheatley, loads and loads of, oh, kind of Sturgis. <laughs> yeah, he's interviewed me. Stop that. <laughs> and I've noticed that when I go to people, I, I send them an email because I'll notice something they're doing, and I'll say, hey, I have a podcast. It, it's like, it's magic. People suddenly say, ooh, you have a podcast, you must, that must be very special, because, mm. I don't know, it is kind of. It, it is kind of. Um, it's, I think it's got a reputation of being slightly more casual, a little more floppier than radio, which, you know, this is like a very, you know, well-known, established medium, so you have to like, be there all the time, and people get a bit nervous, whereas a podcast has a slightly more casual feel about it, mm. and people are, are kind of chill with that, and they know that podcasts are growing in popularity, that they're able to embed it on their own site, and direct people to it, and yeah, they're good fun, they've got that attitude. And it sells books, I mean, people yeah. are happy to promote their stuff, and yeah. I promote them, and they prom and they in turn promote the podcast, yeah. so it becomes kind of a nuclear reaction. It's, it's lovely that way. Mm. Um, so be persistent, keep on plugging away. Most people I don't have to email twice, but some, but because nearly everyone's like, yeah, no, sure, that'd be great. It depends on your niche. If you're someone who's like, I'm going to podcast about Hollywood heroes, you're going to find it a lot tougher. Okay. But um, if you're someone who is like in your particular field of linguistics, they might not be asked about their opinion too much, or certain uh, genre of sci-fi, they might not be asked, and they they love to be able to get that out there. Or hey, I'm a, I'm a genuine fan of your work. I, I'll only take 10 minutes of your time. Here's the questions ahead of time. Let's talk it out. And they go, oh, yeah, okay, sure, why not? Um, the danger is that they might not be very media savvy and not very yeah. used to presenting, especially if they're academics in my field. I have occasionally spent hours editing out ums. Yep. Um, one way to cut down on ums is to ask them, would you like me to send you the question ahead of time so you feel more comfortable about what you're going to be asked? And then if you say something particularly scandalous or interesting, I might go off script and say, really? So how did that start? Because mm. it intrigues me. That sometimes helps too. And honestly, many people who are being interviewed will find it valuable to get that media experience. It's like, yeah, okay, I've done this. I can add this to my CV. I have been uh, interviewed by this podcast. I learned something as well as you learning something about your show. It's a great opportunity. Mm. Let's keep it moving. Uh, okay, being a good interview is kind of tricky. I think you have to be a, a, a curious person. Keep asking them questions, and I think the most useful thing is follow their questions down the rabbit hole. Good follow-up questions are super important. If they say something surprising or that you didn't expect, go ahead and ask uh, about that. Oh, tell me more about that. Or, or, well, wait a minute, what you just said, doesn't that mean this? Listen, 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 listen. Some of the worst interviews I've ever heard, um, and even you know, put out in professional radio. It's like they have a stock standard. Do be do be do be ba ba do be do. See, do do. So, oh God, come on! You know, he just <laughs> tweeted about the car accident he had on the way to the studio. Ask him about that. You know, yep. that sort of thing. That that can be good fun too. Um, in terms of finding interviews, some of the worst interviews I've ever done have been in wacky, uh, bad audio circumstances, there were buses going past, there was airplanes going by, a fan ran right in the middle of the interview and started going, oh my god, about it all. And was that Minchin? That was Tim Minchin. <laughs> and um, I just kept track of the interview and managed to get the, and edit out the bits. So yeah, that's what happens. Okay, this might not be so relevant, so we'll just gloss over this. There are audio programs that you can use. Audacity is free and very good, but there are lots of others like GarageBand, Audition Pro Tools, and uh, then the next bit is some minutiae of audio quality, but that's in the slides, so um, 
you got to find a good balance between audio quality and file size when you are uh, when you are distributing this thing. Mm. Uh, check around online, see what other people use. They'll give you advice too. There's even groups on Facebook on podcasting communities that will help you out with this. Even just take a podcast that you like and open yeah. the file up and see what settings they used for that very file. Yeah, or email them. They're happy to tell you. I mean, yeah, yeah why not? Okay, now, once you've made the podcast and you want to get it out there, there are a number of ways to do it. I use iTunes because they, you know, it's the, everybody has it and it's a good way to get out there. Uh, the only bad side is that you have to make an XML file that looks a bit like what you see in this slide and it's a little bit frightening. But don't worry, if you want, I will give you a copy of my XML file and you can just go ahead and change all the details. Mine works and it'll work for you too. And if you cannot be bothered with this sort of stuff, you can use programs, which is what I do. To hell with XML. I'm not going to bother doing all that twiggly <laughs> shit. I'm just going to hop onto Libsyn and it does it all for me. It's kind of like using WordPress. You go da 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 highlight all the bits, upload my file, press go bang. Yeah, I can't be asked. But it's not free. It's not free though, but I'm willing to let somebody else do the hard <laughs> work for me. And that's only about maybe uh, $20 a month. And because I've managed to get sponsors and people out there, they, they help me out to break the costs. On we go. Uh, SoundCloud is good. Absolutely free again. All you have to do is says, would you like to put it in the description here? You put it in the description, upload your audio here. You upload the audio and that's it. You don't have to learn any language nothing whatsoever and a lot of radio stations have picked up on this a lot of people who are promoting their own music have picked up on this i don't see why anybody else should be frightened to do so as well youtube's good as i, I experimented with putting my audio files onto youtube with a flat title card and it went nowhere so i think if you're doing youtube you have to have something to look at actually have a podcast have illustrations there's a couple of them out there which are good fun i've seen a few people attempting to do podcasts where they'd have different photos throughout it, but they're still just not popular. Honestly, if you are mm. podcasting, podcast, putting audio upline on YouTube just doesn't seem to crack it. You have to actually have something interactive. Oh, yeah. we have a hand. Yeah, I'm one of the people I would follow on YouTube. CPG Greg has a podcast called Hello Internet, and he does normal iTunes, but he also just uploads it to YouTube just to get that much more coverage. Yeah. It can, it, uh, the uh, comment was, uh, using YouTube can expand your coverage by quite a bit, and that's really true. Not only because everyone can get access to YouTube easily and everyone's there, but also YouTube suggests you to people with related interests. Yeah, that's true. So that's um, nice. I occasionally do podcasts and that helps me tap into both, as it were. People can download it um, off iTunes as a, as a video or they can just hop onto YouTube and check it out for themselves. Next. Okay. Uh, I've never tried Ello. That's a new one. What's that? Ello, the third one. Oh, yeah, that. it's a new one. I'm experimenting with Allo, although I don't know if I'm going to keep doing it. But I, I just try to keep as many fingers in as many pies as I can. So I have my Facebook page, I have my Twitter feed, I've got Allo, I was doing YouTube, but I'm going to stop. Um, what else? Oh, Google Plus. Google Plus, yeah. You know, even though nobody goes there. I, I usually think to myself, I go to Google Plus in order to say hello to my New Zealander fans, because that's where they all hang out. Mm. I go onto Facebook to say hello to the Australians and the Americans because that's where they hang out. And I go onto Twitter for everybody, but especially the Germans because they're awesome and they're always on Twitter. So it's sort of like a bit internationally-ish. I, I feel sad if I neglect Google Plus because I never know what the New Zealanders are up to. There's a difference. There's a difference in culture. But the main thing is just to keep on building and keep on promoting. Like my Facebook feed is going nuts right now because I try to put one or two things that I find interesting on there every single day yeah and it really does build and build and build and we're getting up to something like 400 likes now we're going to cross over that i think i've heard that 500 is some kind of self-sustaining nuclear reaction yeah i don't know i think i'm up to about 2000 likes on facebook but mine are not <laughs> but in compact but mine are not a very interactive community. They occasionally share. They've only more recently become braver about commenting, and I'd love to encourage that further. So yeah. you actually have more of an interactive community. I'm wondering if that might also be due to the fact that you have a radio show. Maybe. Whereas mine's just the podcast. It's not just podcasting that you need to do. You need to be doing the whole package. Yeah. Okay, branding. Um, you've got cards and a logo, have you not? I did mine. I, I did my Here's own one we prepared logo. Anyway. That's like my second try. I think it's quite special, actually. You're welcome to grab a card on your way out. I brought a million of them and get, get them now while I'm not very famous. Yes. Um, like design. But having a even hiring a graphic designer to do you a logo can be a good thing. Just 
makes it makes it look impressive up front and mm. like you are a thing. Yeah. Uh, a logo was one of the first things I got in order to do my podcast. I had stickers for a while. I've got about three different shops out there. Not many people buy stuff, but occasionally they do, and that's a lovely thing. Mm. And I ended up doing a graphics design course for about six months just in order to teach myself how to do more logos, more graphic work, and, and yeah, promote that area. Because I just like the art of it. I think it's Did you do your logo? Hmm? Uh, the cat one, I actually won in an auction. There was a podcaster's fundraiser. Oh, cool. And the token skeptic logo, which is the little cat, uh, for this little magnifying glass was like a prize and I ended up winning that and I just contacted the graphic designer he said okay I'll do you anything and I said okay I want like this with this and this and this and he just did it on the first go and I said thank you that's it and he said wow you're the easiest customer I've ever had and um, since that point I've got great friends really awesome inspiring friends who are graphic designers and it's due to their beautiful work which uh, Catherine Donaldson of Faster Pussycat Productions Melbourne she rocks um, she is just a genius. She's almost like psychic, which is pretty scary for someone who investigates paranormal topics. She's almost like a psychic in terms of knowing what should fit. And so I've lent on her for that and for other work. Paid her. Always important to pay these people. Um, you know, they're doing work the same way we are. And essentially, yeah, then taught myself uh, three classes in order to have to do more. Let's keep it moving. Let's what else? It. Oh, yes. Have you this had any of this? Scanners? I have had one email recently. Hello, insert name here. We noticed that you have a podcast for three hundred dollars. We will promote your show across a number of radios. This is very recent, and yet you get this kind of spam in general all the time. You know, so, uh, you know, what was it? Nine one scams from mm. uh, you know, countries in Africa and stuff like that. But now it's starting to get more and more podcasty focused. Mm -hmm. Instead of you know, we'll help you out with your website. Now it's we'll promote your work, and so yeah. Don't, don't pay for this stuff unless it's through a proper website who are going to do it like Ipsy. Getting paid for what you do is kind of important. It can be an important source of motivation. So there are lots yeah. of ways to do it. Patreon and Flatter. Uh, Kickstarter and GoFundMe. I, I have mostly just relied on PayPal buttons and, and also ads on the website. But uh, what's been your experience? Because you, you know more about this. I have a Patreon campaign. I've got, I get around about a whole $40 an episode, and yet I also have private funders who have incredibly kindly supported the show since the beginning, and they have just used PayPal, and they're not pub their donations are not publicly available. So I actually get enough to cover the podcast and a little bit more, which I put aside and I use for upgrades. So Patreon's a great way of doing it. Flatter is how my Germans help me out. They throw a couple of euro every month or so it's really cute you know it's just a couple of euro and then by the end of two months i get about nine dollars on the exchange rate and i don't care it's like thank you guys that's coffee you know yeah. uh kickstarter i've done that for my second book that is going to be coming out at the end of the month i sent it in for printing printing looked terrible so i've rejected and sent it in again um the first book that i did wasn't kickstarter but i certainly recommend it if you have a large project that you want to do like i'd like to go over to conference i'd like to be able to do this yeah, look into it and see what you can do. Go find me, sing like, and PayPal buttons. They work. Uh, some people do ads. Oh, there are things that you can do if you're getting really successful. The multiple tiers thing where you give out one version of your podcast but have people pay for a slightly extended version. Dan Savage with the Savage Podcast does this. Kind of Thinky as well. Kind of Thinky have a live show that they do in Canberra and they just record it and then they put it on Vimeo and say, hey, if you want to see the whole season, all three of them, just pay us $5 and essentially you get... Uh, the show for free and yeah they're a really fun show I opened up a Zazzle store for merchandise but it's doing nothing so I guess the show isn't big enough yet but, but you have the funniest puns on your merchandise I love your merch it's hilarious thank you yeah. and then, everyone can linguistics it's just great <laughs> I'm gonna be working on a book uh, you've already done a few as you mentioned I've got this I transcribe my interviews I write articles out of my interviews and um, they're printed in magazines they're printed in books and people promote them that way so that's another source of income but this is kind of advanced once you get going so it's down the road the question is is it worth it is it worth it doing all the work that we do putting out shows and i think yes i think it needs to be happening we need more science communicators i don't even mind if somebody does a linguistics podcast like i do because I, the slogan i use is a rising tide lifts all boats mm -hmm. we need more people not less it's um, really bad being the only solo female skeptical podcaster in Australia. I really wish there were more and I'd love to encourage more of them, which is why I've, this is probably the fourth 
sort of presentation I've done like this one, encouraging other people to do podcasting, I'd encourage people to podcast in philosophy, for example, in English, get your English students to do it and so forth. It's it's something to look at and consider doing. Basically, it, it adds to my professional life and my interest considerably because every week I have to go and find something interesting yeah. and bring it back. And then I find that I bring that into my classes that I teach. I'm like, oh, you know, I did a podcast on this about a year ago and you should check it out. Mm. It ended up changing my career due to podcasting and the interest that I had in podcasting. I went from being an English and philosophy teacher to becoming a radio DJ. I went away and did school for a year, continue to periodically podcast during that time and then realized that the sort of things I loved in podcasting had flaws and I wanted to improve them using the radio training I did and I think my podcasting has improved because of that. Do you find the podcasts are getting bigger? Podcasts are indeed hitting the headlines. We have groups like um, Welcome to Night Vale to thank for that. <laughs> we have Serial to thank for that. We mm. have pretty much every radio station out there who suddenly realized that, oh, we don't just have to have ephemeral going out into the airwaves and forgotten all the occasional mp3 link on the site well, let's actually put it onto itunes let's put it onto soundcloud next thing you know um triple j say hey triple j's hack how about we turn it into a podcast and then everyone can download it npr jumped on this in a big way and i have had people ask me hey if you create the podcast for us we are willing to pay you and support you for it so we're in the middle of a boom time at the moment and yeah we need more of it careers are being made okay so just to wrap it up here's the mindset that i hope that people will have what's our time like uh, we, we are ahead ourselves. Yeah, that's why I've been looking at the watch. Is it half past? Uh, it's only just past half past. Excellent. I know. We, we are going wrong. Yeah. Phew. Um, okay, here's uh, just some, some ways to think, some things to keep in mind. First of all, love your area. I really think language is cool, and that's why I like doing what I do. And uh, I You never think... stop. That's the thing. It's like, you know, if you didn't have this outlet, I don't know what you'd be doing. I can't turn it off. Yes. I'd be unbearable. Well, no, I already am, but okay. Um, it, uh, it has added to my life immeasurably, and I think that that enthusiasm that I have for language really comes through, and that's why people dig what we are putting out there. But you have to hone your expertise. You have to be an enthusiast. You don't have to know everything, but you have to be well-versed enough in your field to be able to talk about what it is that you're doing. If you're, if you're doing a sci-fi podcast, Make sure that you're in that world. Make sure that you're keeping up. And, uh, and being part of the community and being here at SwanCon is one way that you are doing that. Yeah. Uh, not everyone's going to be a monster about it. Sometimes it feels like you're shouting into a void and all you get are Twitter people saying, we hate you, but no, you, you just keep on going because you know that there are people who are passionate about podcasting, passionate about the topic that you're into, um, are keen to do the next download and the numbers show it. And sometimes the numbers are really, really small to begin with. It's like, 40 listeners, yes! And your parents say, what's a podcast? And you say, I'm up to episode 150, you still don't get it, do you? And your family have absolutely no idea what you do or why you're going to be going to a science fiction convention in order to talk about this thing that doesn't come in a tin. We thought it comes in a tin. It isn't a podcast in a tin. But yeah, you just, you just keep on plugging at it because if you get into it and you love it, at times, it, at times it feels like you're in a rocket and you're on the launch pad and you're burning a lot of energy and it seems like you're not getting anywhere, but eventually the rocket does take off and it starts to move and you take less and less energy to go very quickly. And, and, you, and you never know, you might get a lucky break, you might get enough people who are passionate about it as well and suddenly the sky's the limit. Mm. You will not get it right every time. Uh, actually it was Kitty who asked me, do you ever get it wrong on the show? And, uh, I, and I said, um, Oh, I can't think of a time when I did and then I realized oh no that's not because I never got it wrong it's because I don't know that I got it wrong and that's bad. I've had two interviews which inflamed people one was a guy who talked about a particular field of hypnosis and some of the stuff he was saying was wrong and I went oh and I made a comment online in terms of okay I don't personally follow what he's saying here in regards to this and I've actually read some literature on it so I know that he's not actually telling you the whole truth there but hey he's a magician probably probably helps him out not to get the whole truth. Sure. And um, the second one was someone who said something quite firmly in an ideological way that I really don't believe in. And I made a comment in my notes saying, she says some things which I don't believe in, but I also know that she's a really 
strong promoter of this, that, and the other. So have a listen, see what you think, and see what you think of her. And someone on Twitter got really angry, said, I would have shut off the microphone and kicked her out of the room immediately because she said this. And I said, yeah, but I questioned her about it during. I said, well, why do you say that it is? that it is and put it on the back foot and said, what, don't you believe it too? I said, no, I don't. For example, I can see this, that and the other. She, oh, okay, well, I believe this. I said, okay, fine. It's up to you to make your own mind up. And so having someone who said something that wasn't quite accurate and having some, someone say something that was not particularly politically correct, hey, that's, that's part of the show. We're not all meant to be in an echo chamber of, oh, yes, don't we just love X? We just love X. Isn't X wonderful? X is just so fabulous. Okay, thank you so much for listening. And don't forget, love your X. And click. It's not meant to be like that. I've actually started to have people on the show that I disagree with. That's healthy. <clears throat> that's, that's how it should be. It yeah. is good. And uh, interestingly, they, they get to explain their point of view. And sometimes I come around a little bit. But that's the back and forth of science. Yeah. When you do get it wrong, it's okay to have a show. In fact, uh, yeah. one of the things I really respect about uh, the Skeptoid podcast. Skeptoid podcast, uh, Brian Dunning. Every once in a while he will have uh, a show called Things I Got Wrong or Things in Which I Have in Error Been. Yeah, he does essays and he reads out essays and sometimes his, his essays aren't quite right or new information has come to hand and you do a item and you move on from there. People think there, about money. There's never a last word. I love a poem by, we have a mutual friend, the Digital Cuttlefish. Yes. Who wrote a poem about science and I, the only part I can remember is um, he wrote about the things he saw and all the things he knew, and when sometimes he got it wrong, he wrote about that too. Yeah, exactly. And that's how it should be. Yeah, why not? It's very helpful. It gives you a whole new episode. It's like I'm stuck for a show. <laughs> I know I'll do about all the stuff that I've learned since Talk I through my that. mistakes. Yeah. Okay, the next thing is find <laughs> awesome. Talk about X and how awesome, awesome X is. Don't we love X? Yeah. <laughs> okay, well, yeah, but finding good stuff yeah. and saying, hey, I think that thing you did was good. People love that. And it is true. It is, it, as long as it isn't too echo chambery, hey, you know, sometimes you need to sing along with the choir because, I mean, you know, otherwise you just sit there grumping the whole time. That's not fun, much fun either. Yeah. So if you, if you pimp the people who make good stuff, they will pimp yeah. you back. Some of the people that I've interviewed have now become Twitter followers and they feed me information and I feed them information and the love just goes around. I'm always sending you um, snapshots of books in yeah. bookstores. Oh my God, there's a new book, Daniel. Hey Daniel, snap Instagram. <laughs> have you checked out the author on this yet? I did not know about this book. I think I will have to interview the author and then I do and then it's another show. And then it's like, yes, I contributed to a show and I feel happy. <laughs> do your research, know your stuff. That's important. But if, even if your stuff is um, how much we all love the old Fraggle Rock TV shows and it's just you and two other friends going off about it, you know, we watch the Fraggle Rock shows and revisit it as an adult. You, know, you might think that it. everything that you know about is already known by someone else, and that's kind of true, but that makes listeners feel good. Oh, I knew that. But, and also, nobody <laughs> knows everything, so yeah, it's true. all adding. It's all putting information on the table. If you're thinking about doing this, get started, and you need to start soon. And the reason I say that is because your first few shows will be rubbish. Uh, I did about 100 episodes, no, wait, how many? Yeah, about 50 to 75 episodes that, we, that I didn't post. Most of the people who I know who are in professional podcasting, I mean, podcasting after 300, 500 episodes, say that the first six to seven just aren't on because they're so bad, and that's okay. You know, give it a shot. One of the things I learned from My Kitchen Rules, if it's not good, don't put it on the plate. Right? Yeah. <laughs> I, a lot of, and yeah, the first year or so was just practice for me, and I'm glad I got that practice. I wish I had started later and shoved more in the drawer and never had them come to life. I wish you know, that I'd started later on. And, and that's okay. I have, I have seen people become paralyzed about starting. They don't have this. They are not quite sure. Oh, it needs to be perfect before I start. And yeah, and it won't be. It can be some, something that seems to be a very small thing, can be a huge hurdle. Just give it a try. Be part of the community. Know people. Um, part of this is going to be through interviews, but part of it will be through things like SwanCon. Yeah. Um, you never know where you're going to find contacts. Poke around online. Yeah. Tap into other shows that are out there. Get encouragement from them. Promote yourself, be a shameless self-promoter, or a shameful self-promoter, that's good too. Um, yeah, I mean, 
where would John Scalzi be without his Twitter account? It was through that that I first learned about his books, for example. You've got and, to be everywhere. Yeah. <laughs> There's, they say that success is being at the right place at the right time, but you can't really do that. So what you have to do is be everywhere all the time. Yeah, and you've got to turn up. So you know, turning up is sometimes half the win because how many times have our own insecurity stopped us from turning up? Or the knowledge that no matter, even if you turn up, people go to hate you anyway. Who cares? Do it anyway. Okay. Mm. Keep going, takes a while to get noticed, and it takes a while to get good. Uh, but there's also a lot of people who lurk and who don't say anything, but they're listening out there too. Yeah, I, I keep saying this simply because it is such an important thing, that confidence stuff. Can you tell us about burnout? I, uh, I have to keep on going because every week there's a new show, so I haven't burned out yet. He has a timetable. If RTRFM doesn't have his show for an hour on a Tuesday, they've got a great big blank app and they'll just play awesome music. Play music. But, but yeah, it's, yeah, but you've got a fan base and you've got people who listen to you and people I know because I've been on that radio show who'll phone in and say, can, can, you, can you tell Daniel? Can you tell Daniel that I was listening? And I want to add this, and I know it's a pre recorded bit. Can you, can you tell him that this? Because I want to be in the show. Okay, yes, I, I will. I, I didn't know this. That. Yeah, I know. You, never, you don't get to see that. See, that's another thing. No you don't get to see that stuff. So, yeah, keep, keep it going. Burnout, also known as the technical term pod fading. It's where someone has done some podcasts for a while, and then they just fade out and burn away. I have got some great equipment from people who are pod faded because I said, yeah, I'm not, just not going to keep this up anymore. I'm going to stop and sell off my equipment and that's it. So I appreciate those people who pod because they give us lessons for those who continue on um, and sometimes equipment. But it does happen and it's not anything to be ashamed of. Sometimes it just doesn't work out. Sometimes the partner that you did the podcast with, you get a divorce or it breaks up or they move to a different city or they're just not interested in them or you yourself run out of inspiration. There's been a couple of times I've run out of inspiration. That's why my show is rather sporadic because I say, I'm going to podcast when I feel like it, and so I have a sort of a disjoint. You might get two episodes in two weeks, you might get one episode in two weeks. The closest I ever got to pod fading, I had a listener contact me, and he said, look, I noticed you haven't brought out an episode in a while, it's just sitting up to the two week mark. I've done this awesome interview with this fellow here in Germany. Could you please put this audio on your podcast? And I just broke out of tears and cried for about two days because it showed to me that this person cared enough about my show that he wanted to donate audio and he wanted the show to continue so I put his interview up and since that time I just remember him and how he was saying you know don't give up keep on keep on going and yeah I, I get close sometimes especially with negative um, attitudes but in the end I just keep saying to myself no I enjoy this too much I'm going to keep on going so if you feel like stopping stop you can always come back to it you could always reborn like the phoenix in a new format it happens at the same time be sure to expect a little bit of lack of inspiration i remember something from matthew inman of the oatmeal who said something like you know after my fifth show he was like or fifth cartoon for him it was like yeah. that's it i've got no more ideas mm -hmm. and then after his 500th cartoon he was like well that's it <laughs> i've got no more ideas mm -hmm. and i felt that way too it's like i think i've talked about everything in language five times. Can I, is there really any more to say? And there's always more to say. There's more to talk about. And there's, in many ways, unlike radio is slightly stricter in that regard, which is why I'm glad I'm more of a podcaster than a radio person. Podcasting, there is no rules. If you want to do your entire show backwards in another language, you can. I've seen people do this. If you want to do the entire show, you sitting in the hallway of the hotel while you're waiting to be checked into the convention, you can. That's 30 minutes of audio of you sitting there saying, and now there's a large lady walking up to the counter. She's trying to get my room. She's throwing a handbag at the man who will not have my room. I've been here since 2 a.m. I'm keeping my room. So you're listening to the Standing Around in the Hallway podcast. And we're going to be going into this even more. Oh my God, there's a small child coming in. You know, I've, I've done rubbish like that. Here I am at the airport. They still haven't called my flight. So I hope you've been checking out the desert. You know, just, just rip. I mean, why not do it? Um, you know, in, in between, there are no rules in podcasting. I've seen podcasts where people have done, you know, just entire musical interludes. And then that's it. Go for it. Why not? Enjoy it. Also, don't forget oh, to get paid. It is. Yes. Have, I mean, it's not why we do what we do. No, but don't go broke over doing this. Yeah. Please don't. don't. Okay. Yeah. Um, if you can get paid for it, and there are ways to get paid for it. You know, people will donate. You can run advertising on your site. Um, what were some of the ones that I wrote down? Um, you hear this all the time on Serial, for example, uh, the podcast Serial. Mailchimp. Yeah, 
This podcast is sponsored by MailChimp. You just, you know, do a small spiel. Uh, Audible.com. The amount of times I've heard podcasts, you know, this podcast is brought to you by Audible.com. If you hop into Audible.com, you'll get your first free download novel. Make sure you put in the uh, URL token skeptic when you put in for your free novel. And from that point onwards, you get 20% off all books on their offers. Check out Audible.com. Proud sponsors of TokenSkeptic.org. There you go, that was like a 20 second ad, goes into your podcast. I don't do it myself, but I've heard other shows do it. And whether or not it's a huge money earner, I don't know, but hey, it's it's something that might help you out. Are they fairly generous with even unknown podcasts? Yeah, because they're just trying to get the word out to everyone. Mm. Um, yeah, do a bit of research, find out what's out there. Um, yeah, I'll be willing to help. So we, you know, we're both willing to help anyone who might be looking for that sort of opportunity. In general? Get going and keep going. You have something to say. What you want to say is worthwhile. And that's it. That's us. So we are uh, we are taking questions. And we got ten minutes to do it. We we're on time. We're doing all right. We're done. On time. I was trying to report some uh, stuff in the other rooms. So maybe not at the convention. Mm. And um, when I was checking in through three point five mils, I was getting a lot. Yeah. Yeah. Is that would that fix it? If you're uh, this one I have. Craig, used. could you repeat the question? Okay. Essentially, he was asking about whether or not the XLRs and the certain plugins that you can have on uh, audio equipment, like MP3 recorders, can help out, and whether or not they'll cut down on buzz. Good question. I have used this in one event because this is fairly new. It was plugged into the soundboard of an event for SciTech. That's another thing. Sometimes you can contact places and you say, hey, I'd like to record this particular event. Can I use the audio in my podcast? And I'm like, sure, why not? And it's awesome. Um, I used that for, for a SciTech live event. They plugged it into the soundboard. It didn't have any fuzz on it. Um, I honestly don't know too much about what might be. It could be the board itself. But certainly, yeah. Yeah, um, yeah. poke around and see, and see what's out there. Um, the Zoom H4, uh, there's also Zoom, um, there's a Zoom, yeah, this is a Zoom H4, there's also a Zoom 4, I believe, and several other versions of the Zoom. I've got a Zoom 1 that's sitting over there, for example, and they have plugins at the bottom of there, and they're quite useful. Shop around, poke around, you'll, you'll find variations on that, and just give them a try. Yeah. Um, another thing that I've discovered is that sometimes you can hire them too, and I hired some in Melbourne, and they worked hard too. Try before you buy. <coughs> I have very little experience with tinkering with the audio because I have a radio station to work in, and that's been nice. <laughs> and, and that's another thing. Um, I ended up getting audio onto the Joondalup 89.7 FM, which is Twin Cities up in Joondalup. Um, I contacted them when they were first looking for radio shows to do, and they were doing a radio show called um, uh, movers and shakers and they said look what we would like is a small segment to play during the last half hour of our show can you come up with something and I said yeah I don't want to do token skeptic podcast because usually it goes just over 30 minutes and it's slightly more centric on parallel and pseudoscientific beliefs so I do a 10 to 15 minute segment called the science sorbet where I go out and I interview local scientists and they just put it online for me I record it edit it because it's a radio station, you have permission to use commercial music, which is really cool. That's another thing you should look into. Make sure a copyright of commercial music. We can talk to you about that later if you're interested. But because it's a commercial radio station, um, I'm able to use copyrighted music. And so I created using um, Thomas Dolby's Blind Me with Science. I sort of mixed that up, and that's my theme tune to the intro to it. And I play a bit of air in the background as I do the intro. And today we're going to be talking to a man who has made over $5 million out of beehives. Two guys over in Queensland. Um, Let's check them out. And, and then I play the interview, and then I have a little outro track with a bit from the Diviners playing in the background, and that sort of thing. And that's fun. And that's, um, yeah, just a simple bit of audio. Consider doing that. Contact a radio station, say, hi, hey, I can regularly give you, just like Talk the Talk, regularly give you. A 20 minute segment that you can throw onto your current affairs show that will be focused on this and it will be polished, it'll be great. I can come into your studios and do it there anytime at all. Give it a try. There are so many different ways of podcasting, so many different situations in which it happens. So, find yours. Other questions? All right, well, hey, if you, uh, if you need inspiration, please come and see us. Grab a card of mine on the way out if you feel like and uh, get in touch if you need anything. 
And if you hop onto the hashtag SwanCon on Twitter, you'll see that I have live tweeted everything that I've done here by remote access. I've scheduled all the tweets, so you'll see links to absolutely everything that I've mentioned here. And um, yeah, I'll let my Twitter account do the work for me. Huh? And uh, if everything worked out properly, this will be on YouTube on the Talk to Talk channel. So, hello, fans. See ya. <laughs> Thanks, everyone. Thank you.